And we realize sometimes physical ailments and things prohibit that, and so we understand that. <clears throat> My thought this morning is rejoicing even in the midst of troubles. And as I begin to look at this, I begin to think about, as our pastor even said this, and uh, great minds think alike, don't they? Amen. But I've also been told terrible minds do too, so I don't know you can kind of figure that one out yourself. <laughs> but I've looked back over the last several months and a year or so, and this seemed like in, uh, uh, so many of you have gone through so many different things, and uh, uh, things are different today than they was 12 months ago. Things are just different. We may not like them. Sometimes they're better. Sometimes they're worse. But we have to accept what the Lord brings us through, don't we? And to and through. Starting at the fourth verse, Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse number 4, listen to what Paul says here. Rejoice in the Lord always and be, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful, or in other words, don't be anxious, don't worry about nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Thank God for that this morning. Let's pray. Father, God, we come before you this morning on this uh, service that we celebrate thanksgiving realizing lord that many hearts are troubled and many uh, lives have been changed over the last uh, few months and last year or so but god we know that you're the same you're the same yesterday today and forever and father as we come to you this morning we ask you father to touch every person here today no matter what situation no matter what they may be going through but we know that you're god and, Father, we ask you this morning to just comfort everyone. And, Father, uh, those that aren't here today, we ask you as well to touch them. And, Father, I ask you this morning to give me the anointing of your presence of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, for God, we certainly need that most of all. And, Father, we ask you to just give us ears to hear and a mind to understand and a heart to, un to receive what you have for us today. We love you and give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said amen. amen. You may be seated this morning. Realizing that many of you have faced and are facing difficulties during this Thanksgiving day, I begin to pray and I said, God, what can I say? And I don't want to uh, minimize anything that anybody may be facing because I realize that uh, many are going through some very traumatic situations and things. But I believe that when we read the Word of God, there's promises in the Word of God that we can hold fast and hold true to and believe that. If we'll only believe what God tells us, then we can hold out that hope in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Families during this Thanksgiving time will be gathering around the table uh, and having dinner as they have done so many times in the past. And this is supposed to be a time in which families and friends, they gather together and give thanks and a time to enjoy one another and to reflect on past experiences. But for many, there's been a many a change since the last Thanksgiving. This year, families may be looking a somewhat different. What I mean is sometimes that special loved one is no longer with them. Death has taken them from the rest of the family. Maybe others have family members that have changed jobs and it required them to relocate and go somewhere else and cannot make the journey back to be with that family and they'll look different in that aspect. And some families uh, may even be divided because of hurts and disagreements that has occurred in the past several months. And for many of that this way, this is a sad time, but maybe because of also of the worries and of the pains and the sorrows that they face. 
but some will put their happy face on and they'll continue to go on through the hurtful times as they have so many times. But down deep inside, they're troubled and they're hurting and they're going through some very emotional strains in their lives. Amen. And so we have to, uh, uh, we can find it difficult to find reasons to give thanks on this special occasion during the times that we worry and have all of these uh, sorrows and things that we're facing. But I don't want to underestimate, as I said, and minimize the hurts and the pains. Uh, but I do believe that if we believe, if we put our place or put our joy in the right place and the hope in the right place in that person named Jesus Christ, we can find find reason to be thankful. I read in the book of Psalms, chapter 94, verse 15. Listen to what the writer said. In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts, or my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Psalms also 104 and 34. He said, my meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in God. Amen. I realize that we can all stand up this morning and we can declare certain things that's not been very pleasant that we've had to face. But I declare this morning that I will trust in God. That I will rejoice in God. I will find a time when I can give God the praise and the glory that he so richly deserved. I don't know about you, but he didn't have to do what he did for me. But I'm glad this morning. Yes, there's been people that's been taken out of my life. We've lost so this past few months some of the best friends we've ever had. But you know what? And I've missed them terribly. But you know what? I still want to rejoice in my Lord. You may have lost loved ones. You people of the church have lost family, uh, church family that have gone on to be with the Lord. But I can tell you today that we can still rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Amen. In the fourth verse, it said, rejoice in the Lord always. We are not to rejoice, but we are to rejoice in the Lord. Right. Circumstances sometimes uh, rain on how we feel. But well, you know what I do? I get my mind off of my circumstances. And I put my heart upon the one that is able to give me that joy. I rejoice in Christ. Not because maybe I'm going through something or what I'm facing it, whatever. But I'm rejoicing in Christ. Not in circumstance. I'm rejoicing in the Lord. Does anybody hear me this morning? And I can tell you this morning, it doesn't matter what we are facing in our lives right now. God has a power that is called a joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm here to tell you that the God we serve, He has more joy than the despair that may be facing uh, that we may be facing in our lives he's got more power uh, that will cause us to rise above our uh, enemies our discouragement uh, I'm telling you that we've got a God uh, that's able to fill us up with the joy uh, oh yes uh, maybe we don't have this one uh, or maybe this is looking bad uh, but I'm here to tell you this morning uh, that the God I serve uh, he has a joy uh, that can fill a vessel uh, and give us joy unspeakable this morning now, he said to rejoice always. But I want you to think about this for a minute. Paul said to rejoice in the Lord always. That has a double meaning. Because it's difficult sometimes to rejoice right. even in the Lord, isn't it? Well, but let's look at it like this. If we can rejoice in the Lord always, there also lies the benefit. Huh? Huh? Let that sink in just a minute. Yes, it is difficult sometimes to rejoice in God. Amen. It is sometimes difficult. When you're going through situations and loved ones are no longer there. 
by your side. It is difficult. But when we can learn to rejoice in the Lord always, not just when things are good. Let me tell you something, folks. If you're waiting for the perfect time, when everything is right, when everything is going good, when everything is the way it ought to be, and you're just as happy as whatever can be, and you're waiting for that moment to find the time to rejoice in the Lord, you ain't going to find it. Because you always have problems. You'll always struggle. But I'm glad this morning that, amen, there's a benefit in rejoicing in God. So Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. Always. When you're going, when things are going good, rejoice in Him. When there ain't going good, rejoice in Him. Amen. And then again, he said, Rejoice. Rejoice in afflictions. Rejoice in pain. No, it's not always wonderful in weariness and disappointment. It's difficult to do that. But Paul had learned this lesson that he's teaching us. He rejoiced in hardships and chains. Why? Because it's believed that when Paul wrote the book of Philippians, he was either in a Roman jail or he was in a house where he was incarcerated and was locked down and was not able to have his freedom. Amen. Paul, in the midst of his binding, in the midst of his struggles, God began to come near him and begin to talk to him and begin to give him a word that he could write to the Philippians. Do you hear what I'm telling you? No, you won't never write a book as far as putting it in the Bible. But you know what? I'm going to tell you that even in our afflictions, even when we feel like we might be imprisoned by our fears and by our discouragements and by our disappointments, that we can still find God near to us. We are not told to rejoice necessarily in our circumstances because I said earlier that if you wait for the right circumstances, they'll probably never come that way. Oh, you might have a good thing happen every once in a while, but the point of it is is that we must learn to rejoice in all things. Amen. Amen. There may be reasons why as Christians is to rejoice or excuse me there, there may be many reasons why we as Christians should rejoice but one of the main reasons is that it allows us to distribute by distracting anxiety over worldly things let me explain that we all have problems we all go through things again I'm not trying to minimize anything but what I am saying when we begin to rejoice in God that takes the distraction off of self and off of me and my problems and begin to glorify God. Amen. And I want to tell you, that's what God wants, isn't it? To be glorified. Paul was not immune to sorrows and pain. Listen to what he said in 2 Corinthians 6 and 10. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. I believe Paul knew what sorrow was, don't you? Oh, yeah. I believe he knew what pain was, don't you? Oh, yeah. I believe he knew what afflictions was. But he said, even in sorrows, I will rejoice always. Even the night before he died, before he was to be beheaded, he, oh, he said, I'm laid, I've got a, 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 a crown laid up for me, and you and I have the same today. Oh, yeah. Amen. Romans 5 and 2 said, By whom also we have access by faith unto this grace where we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. One writer said this, The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. You know why Christians are weak today? Hallelujah. It's because they have no joy. They're looking at their problems. They're looking at their sorrows. And again, I know we have pains and sorrows. But the joy of the Lord is my strength. My meditation on my problems will bring me down. But I'm here to tell you this morning that the joy of God. I'm not talking about the joy of being with somebody. I'm talking about the joy of the Lord. Because the joy of the Lord, who can give it? Nobody can give it but Him Himself. Do you hear me? I can't preach it into you. I can't give it to you. I can't open your mouth and pour it down you. But the Bible tells me that when the presence of the Lord comes near, there is joy in the Lord and that is my strength. Hallelujah. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 10, 20. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not 
that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Jesus had sent his disciples out and given them power to over, over devils and over uh, sicknesses and afflictions and told them to pray for them and heal the sick and cast out devils. They came back rejoicing. But he said, don't, 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 don't do that. Don't rejoice because you can cast out devils. Don't rejoice because you can heal the sick. But rejoice because your name is in the Lamb's book of life. That's what he's talking about. That's why I'm rejoicing. Why do you go through what you go through? Because I know that my name is in the Lamb's book of life. Why do we face what we face? Because we know that our names is in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. I'm glad for that this morning. Aren't you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse number five says, let your moderation be known unto all men. This is being patient in our afflictions and trusting in the Lord to work all things for our good. When we, I, I got to looking at this and I, I want you to look at that if you have your Bibles open. Let your moderation be known unto all men. And then there's a statement there. I wonder why this was here. The Lord is at hand. Paul was in afflictions, wasn't he? So I kind of wonder, Paul, you know, he was writing this and he was going through his uh, emotions and going through things and his struggles. And just all of a sudden, that right there, now maybe it's just me, maybe I'm looking at it wrong, but it's just me, he said, the Lord's at hand. Even in my affliction, Paul said, even in my bondage, the Lord's at hand. Aren't you glad for that? Oh, yeah. oh, the Lord's at hand. I remember back when my mother was getting ready to pass away at the hospital. Amen. And I was, we were there and in, in there. And the doctor done told her she ain't going to make it. To, you know, we, you might as well. You know, they wanted to, me to give her the, the decision to take her off her life support. One of the hardest decisions I ever made in my life. Amen. Was when I told her to take her off her life support. But we had already heard. And I had already talked about it. I knew her wants and her wishes and things. But you know what I, we were standing there and I was sad obviously along with some of the other family and the pastor we had at that time was there with us and we was in the hospital room right there and I was holding my mother's hand and I said oh God help us today and I began to feel something I began to feel the presence of God we'll tell you what even in death you can still feel the power of God can't you hallelujah do you hear me today I'm here to tell you the Lord's at hand and whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever your need, whoever you're dealing with, whatever your circumstances, that the God, oh, Paul said, oh, I might be in this prison, but there's one right here with me. And I tell you, you might be in a hospital room, but the God's with you. Do you hear me today? God is at hand. Hallelujah. Maybe while he was writing this, particular part, his heart, Paul's heart was heavy with trials, and tribulations, and he was facing, amen, and the Lord came along beside him to give comfort to him in his time of need, amen. Even though Paul had developed many close relationships while working for the Lord, Timothy, we know, was his spiritual son, Silas. He was the one that was with him in jail one time, and they began to sing the glory down. And there were so many others. And but uh, all close friendships, Paul developed, but he never developed one like the relationship he had with God. Right. Amen. I thank God for my relationships with you. I thank God for what we have. I really do. I thank God for my family. I thank God for my friends outside this church and family outside this church. But I can tell you one thing. There ain't no relationship that you can develop like that one with God. Why? Because friends will let you down. Friends can't get to you like the Lord can. You can be driving down the road so burdened down or standing in the hospital amen so sick and so worried about something but there's a presence amen that can come in and touch and be near I just can't get off of that God is near Paul said the Lord is at hand 
the Lord is at hand. Hallelujah. The three Hebrew children, oh, let me tell you, they knew the Lord was at hand. Did they not? Daniel, when he was thrown in the lion's den, the Bible said uh, that, the, that they shut the lion's mouth. I'm here to tell you that God is near to each and every one of us during this time of Thanksgiving. Hallelujah. What a powerful presence the Lord was in, in, in Paul's life. Thought about this, talking about the Lord's at hand and his presence. What a difference that someone's presence is in our lives when they come in. And what I mean by that is you talk about Maybe that husband who is sick physically when maybe the flu or whatever just got real sick or maybe going through some other things that's not very hopeful but when that wife touches that husband what a presence that is. I also thought about when children that parent comes into their presence what a difference that presence of that parent's presence in the lives of their children yeah. don't ever underestimate the value of your presence to your children or to your grandchildren oh, amen. amen I always loved being with my mama I never knew my daddy. Y'all know a lot of that story, and I'm not going to get into all that, but I never knew him. But I, my mom and I, we had a good relationship, wonderful relationship, and I always loved being with her. Just being with her. Just sitting and talking with her. Because she just made that influence in my life. You know, she just was so rich. I pastored her for a number of years, and thank God for every day of it. But I thought about that. I thought about how people make influences in our lives, their presence. People come in, and I'm not talking about just the friendship itself, but just when they walk in the room, how you feel, you know, that presence of that person. No, you don't idolize them or nothing like that, but it's just, you know, it's just, just somebody, man, I just, good to see them. Amen. Gil and I, we pass one another every now and then on 127. I'm headed north, and he's headed south. He's getting off work, and I'm moving on. Amen to deliver mail. And I'll see him, that big smiling face and that head stuck out that window. Amen. <laughs> they know what that means to me. Just passing him. Just passing him. How you doing, brother? Amen. Just the presence. Do you see? What a difference. What a presence. But oh, what a presence. What a, what a change. What, a, what, a, what an influence when Christ comes in. Oh, yeah. It makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Amen. When he comes in, oh, I'm telling you what, what a difference. What a powerful, powerful influence he made. Oh, 38 years ago, he came into my life. What a change he made. I was out, I was literally out crawling around in mud, in the dirt, in the mud, and the, and the, uh, uh, the rain was pouring down. But oh, I love that scripture where he said he takes me out of the miry clay. Yeah. That's one of my favorite scriptures in scripture. Because I'll tell you what, he brought me out. Yeah. What a difference. Church, I'm here to tell you tonight. I'm here to tell you this morning. I don't know why he did it other than he's love and he's God. He didn't owe me anything. But I'm glad this morning that from the prayers of dear friends and a wife that wouldn't give up. That God said, hey, I'm going to change him. I'm going to make him into something. I never dreamed he would do what he did. But I'm here to tell you what a difference and an influence. I'm here to tell you today, hallelujah, that God makes a difference. You see, my grandfather, there was a time when I hated Christmas. I hated it. There was a time my grandpa 
killed himself on Christmas Day. He took a shotgun and killed himself. That's all I'm going to say about it, okay? And I found him. And my wife, I tell you, I despised it when we first got married. I didn't necessarily hate it because of Jesus or anything like that. I knew all the meaning. But I despise Christmas Day because it brought back some bad memories to me. But one day, December the 11th, 1983, just about two weeks before Christmas, oh, I met a man who changed my life. I made an influence. Oh, I'll tell you what, I love Christmas now, brother. I love it. I know what it stands for now. I know what it's all about. And I just want to get you to thinking, you know, this time, this, this time of the year and, and, and Thanksgiving, what a difference He makes in our presence. What a difference He makes in our presence. Let me hurry on here. Be careful for nothing, He said. Paul's not telling us to just stick our heads in the sand when troubles and trials come, but what He's telling us is don't allow the cares of this world to hinder our walk with the Lord. As believers in the Lord, it's our duty to put ourselves in a place where our faith in God, put our, where our faith in God and that He is able to keep that which we have put into His hands. In 1 Peter 5 and 7, very familiar scriptures, said, casting all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. Church, you can't help but have cares today. I've got cares, you've got cares. You got things that you're caring about and worried about and trying to work through. Paul's not saying don't worry about them, but don't let them ruin your relationship with Christ. Right. Amen. 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 Don't let them ruin your relationship with Christ. Amen. Don't quit church because of your cares. I got to say it. Don't quit church because of cares. Amen. Don't quit God because of cares. Right. Don't quit praying because of cares. Amen. Amen. Don't quit reading the Bible because of cares. Amen. Don't quit doing what's right and what you know to be doing in your faithfulness to God. Don't quit because of cares. Because if you do that and the devil finds out about it, amen, he's going to aggravate you and see that you have care. You ever met anybody that if they've done something to you and they realize that, they're, that that's aggravating you, they're going to plug you, they're going to aggravate you until, a, until, it, until it just won't, go, won't aggravate you no more? Yes. Amen. i got a friend that way. Amen. But if he finds out something bothers you, he's going to aggravate the devil out of you. But God, but the devil will do that. If he finds something that's going to discourage us, he will use every means possible to discourage us. And I've learned that when I just pray about it and say, Lord, I'm going to cast this upon you. Amen. He kind of leaves that one alone. Now, he'll probably try to plug something else in, but he'll leave that one alone, then you move on. Amen. So Paul's not saying, don't, you know, we've all got cares. He said, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. When anything burdens our spirits, we must ease our minds by prayer. Prayer is the offering up of our desires to God and making them known to Him. Look at what he said there. Let your request be made known unto God. Tell Him about it. If you're mad at the devil, tell Him. Amen. I told somebody here recently, if you, they go to prayer, whether you're not, I said, honey, you might as well tell God about it, how you feel. Because he already knows. Doesn't he tell us that he know, he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities? Amen. 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 He, if you're aggravating with him, you might as well tell him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He's going to know about it. Not that God needs to know or needs to be told either what our wants are or our desires, for He already knows better than we're able to tell Him. But by us coming to Him and asking, it shows our dependence on Him and our faith in Him. And let me tell you that for us to be able to pray in times of distress and sorrow when prayer is most needful and most helpful, we must learn to pray when things aren't so bad. Come on. Amen. 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 Think about that. 
Huh? When we, for us to know how to pray, when things aren't real good, are bad, when they aren't real good, we better learn how to pray when things aren't so bad. Huh? What I mean, you know, well, don't wait till you get in trouble to try to pray. Huh? Pray over them little things. What do you say? Rejoice and go pray over everything. If we can't pray over our food, how are we going to pray against the valley of the shadow of death? Huh? We can't pray over this little need right here and I can't be faithful in that. How am I going to learn to deal with those other drastic things that come that I've got to deal with? So you got to learn how to pray. Amen. Let me hurry. Why is it important for us to learn to pray with thanksgiving? I want to read verses 6 and 7 together, if you'll let me. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God. This is what he says. When we pray and we supplicate over everything and make our known request known, God, he said, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I like that. Yes. I like that. The peace of God, this peace can only come from God who gives it. Can be made only known by the inner experience of each believer. I can stand up here and I can tell you all about the peace of God. I've tasted it, know what it's all about, been there. Many of you have. But as well as I may be able to articulate to you how the peace of God, until you experience it, you'll never know how it feels. Right. Amen. Amen. I can tell you and build it up how wonderful it is, but oh, let me tell you what, it's better felt than tell, ain't it? Amen. 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 And oh, if only the Philippians of Paul's day would turn from the anxiety, from their anxieties to the prayer, they would receive the peace of God. Jesus told him in John 14, 27, he said, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your trouble, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Amen. The trouble is with a lot of people, they're looking for peace in family. Well, they're looking for peace in their church. They're looking for peace in their brothers and sisters. Christ said, I give it. He said, I give it. I'm the one that gives it. I can tell you about it. I can't give it to you. It's like salvation. I can tell you all about being saved, and I can lay down or sit down with you and uh, hold hands with you and pray with you and everything and help lead you to the Lord. But I'm telling you what an experience it is. I can't give you salvation. I can lead you to the one that can. I can't give you joy, but I can tell you about the one that can. Amen. True peace is not found in positive thinking. It's true peace is not in absence of conflict. True peace is not in just some good feeling. True peace comes from knowing that God's in control. Amen. That's the key right there. And as I get ready to close, they're going to get some music. True peace is not just when life is good. <clears throat> true peace doesn't rest. And boy, my life is just so wonderful. I've got plenty of money and i got a good job. And, and those are wonderful things. True peace is not when you don't have any problems. True peace is knowing a man named Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.